precious blood has left me forgiven pure like the whiteness of snow powerful to We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Peter here is going to focus primarily on honoring God and honoring individuals. In fact, it's through honoring individuals, all people, that we really bring honor to God. And Peter's writing to individuals that have come out of paganism and they've come in, you know, they've come into Christianity, they've come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and he wants them to, to bring glory to God and, and to basically shine the new light that has been given to them in order to draw people to God. Even in difficult situations, even when they're undergoing persecution, um, he knows that if, if we show honor to individual, individuals, if we show love and kindness towards individuals, even people who are harming us, um, and they have power over our lives, and they use that power in a wrong way, if we show them honor, we can ultimately bring people to Christ. In fact, we can even bring them to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so that's, that's what Peter's going to be focusing on in this particular passage. And, uh, and I'm just letting you know, that this is a real thick piece of steak this morning. There's a lot here, and, uh, and I, think, I think you're going to really enjoy it as we just really get into it. But there's just, there's a lot here to take a look at. And so I continually cut my sermon down a little bit, and I have a baptism in a little bit. So I'm going to try to move us through this material, but I don't want you to miss out on what's here. It is just absolutely uh, crucial that we really understand where Peter is going with this. So... Let's go ahead and take a look at verse 11 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. 
Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows, sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure? But if, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps." Let's pray. Jesus, we, uh, we are gathered here in your name. And so we just ask God that you would be with us as we consider this passage this morning. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot that we need to understand in our heart of hearts. And so Lord, just open our minds. Open our hearts to receive your word. Bless you, Jesus. Give us the boldness to be your people, wherever you place us. Amen. So looking at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, flesh, which wage war against your soul. So again, Peter is writing to individuals that have been called out of the world. They've been called out of paganism. These individuals, uh, many of them were not raised um, in Judaism, and they certainly weren't raised in the church because the church was just forming. And so they were called out of paganism, out of pagan temple practice, out of a pagan way of life. When we look at our culture today, we see paganism rebounding, coming back. When Christians, when Christianity grew, it pushed back on paganism and pagan practice. One can think of sexuality and the way that's being used today. And so Peter is telling these Christians to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Abstain. Now, passions of the flesh or desires of the flesh, you can translate this in a couple different ways, are not necessarily bad in themselves. If you had no desires of the flesh, you might not eat. You might just starve. Passions and desires of the flesh can actually be good in the right context. You need them to survive. But what Peter is talking about here are passions and desires of the flesh that have been elevated to where they rule you, where they rule us. And that's not good. Passions and desires of the flesh, again, are good and important whether they be for hunger, sexuality, and the like. I mean, nobody would be here this morning if there weren't sexual desires. Okay. But when they are ruling your life, when they take over, and that's what you live for, that's what Peter is concerned about. That's what he's concerned about. And paganism is all about satisfying and gratifying the desires of the flesh. Outside of Christ, that's what we live for. We live for pleasure. 
quick gratification. And that's what's driving our pagan culture. And so Peter's saying, hey, these desires, these way, this way of life, this way of paganism is waging war against your soul, your psuche, your life. It's waging war against the life that you have in Christ. And if you're not careful, you will go back into that way of life and it will destroy you. Now, these desires come from within us and are also outside of us, pulling us. Remember the little cartoon with the two little, the angel and the little demon, you know, like sitting on the, you know, they're both whispering into Bugs Bunny's ear or something. You know, I mean, there's outside forces that are drawing us away, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an even bigger problem. It's the human heart. Every single one of us in this room has a corrupted human heart, a corrupted will, a corrupted spirit. Now, God is transforming that through Jesus Christ. We call that spiritual formation or discipleship. As we die to ourselves and live for God, as we invite Christ into our lives, he begins to work with us. He begins to transform our hearts. But our hearts outside of God are pretty evil. So when people say, well, just follow your heart. No, please don't follow Jesus Christ. Because out of your heart, according to Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, false witness, and slander. That's what's coming out without Christ. Now, Christ transforms our hearts so that that's not what's pouring out of our lives. But as soon as we give in to the passions of the flesh and we begin to make those the things that we live for and aim at in life, our heart becomes corrupted again. It begins to move in that direction and we start producing this again. So Peter continues in verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of salvation. Profession is cheap. We can profess things all day long. Lots of people profess to follow Christ, but don't follow Jesus. Lots of people profess their love for someone and really don't by their actions, right? Actions give us away. So here, Peter's focusing on conduct, actions. Be careful how you live among the Gentiles. Instead of giving in to them. Living in a way that draws them to Jesus. Living in a way that draws others to Christ. God gives us light. Jesus, who is the light of the world, identifies himself as the light of the world, says, you are the light of the world. When Jesus Christ is living in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we become the light of Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 from the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This to me is a parallel passage to verse 12. I believe that Peter is probably thinking about the Sermon on the Mount when he wrote verse 12. I can't find any other parallel so close. And Peter was pretty close to Jesus and was probably right there listening to Jesus when Jesus was sharing his great sermon on the Mount, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. We are to submit our lives to every human institution for one purpose, for the sake of God, to draw people to Christ. That's why we, I mean, that's, that's the main reason. We want to be honorable citizens in this sense. That's our desire. We want to create order. 
We want to respect those who are in authority over us. We've got to be very careful the way we talk about people who are over us. Politicians. The, uh, the police car that is pulling us over because we've sped. How are you going to treat this individual? With respect. Why? Because for the sake of God, we want to bring honor and glory to God. That's why. This person might not be very nice. Might be rude to us. Doesn't matter. We are to bring glory to God. Now certainly, there are situations in history and situations going on right now. I think about the Christians in Russia. How are they supposed to respond with what's going on? Well, sometimes... Because the emperor or the leader is asking us to do something that is contrary to God, we, we have to disobey them. Because we obey God over every human institution. Peter doesn't address this here, but it's very much addressed in scripture. And Peter and the disciples, after being um, told not to say or teach anything about Jesus in the book of Acts... Acts chapter 5, 29 says, we must obey God rather than men. These are words that are coming out of Peter's mouth and the mouth of the disciples who had just been told, don't say anything about Jesus. Well, they know that that's contrary to the will of God and they will follow God over man. By the way, that's my license plate, Acts 5, 29. I really believe in this. Peter's point though is first and foremost to obey the governing authorities, provided they don't ask you to do something that is contrary to God. There is one caveat there. Peter doesn't even mention that, but it's there. And that's why we need all of scripture to interpret scripture and to give us greater context. Verse 15, for this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Christians at this time were fairly new on the frontier of religion. They were being pushed out by the Jews that rejected Christ. Jews, the Jews um, had special status in Rome. I don't know how much you know about this, but they didn't have to go to pagan temples and burn incense to the emperor or any of that as long as they paid a temple tax through the temple in Jerusalem. It was a special arrangement. Rome made no arrangement with any other people. It's pretty interesting. So the Christians were sort of under this arrangement. For a period of time, because all the first Christians were Jews, well, eventually they got pushed out. Jews were Jews that did not follow Christ, rejected Christian Jews that, that did. That created a problem for the Christians. It made them marginalized. They were no longer under this umbrella of protection. They still would not go to the pagan temples and burn incense or worship the Caesars or worship the pagan gods. And so Rome started to come down on them because they're losing temple tax. Because paying tax was a form of worship. Kind of like when we tithe in church, it's a form of worship. This created some real problems for Christians. And so they were marginalized. Now, first by the Jews that had rejected Christ. And now by the Roman authorities and by the authorities all throughout the Roman world. And so they were true exiles they were exiled from their own people. They couldn't participate in weddings oftentimes or go into the public square because it, 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 it involved paganism. It involved pagan temple practice. And so the non-Christians of this time would say, well, what's with these Christians? They stay in their homes. They have this weird meal where they say that they eat and drink Jesus. Cannibals. They called Christians cannibals because of communion. They called Christians atheists because they didn't worship any visible God. Christians were really having a hard time. Persecution was coming down. They were ostracized. They were losing their businesses, financial difficulties, everything. And so Peter wants these Christians to do the will of God and to honor people, to love them, so as to push back 
on the ignorance of the people around them that think that they're actually bad. He's saying, show people that we are filled with the love of God, that we love people, that we respect people, that we're not misanthropists, that we're not people haters. It's quite a strategy, but that's something that Jesus also taught us to love our enemies, to do good to those who persecute us, to push back on them with love, not to fight them with force. Verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. You know, Christians are free. What does he mean by that freedom? He means that, you know what? There's really no authority over us except for God, ultimately. God is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But we don't use that freedom. Just, you know, having God over us and not everybody. We don't use that freedom to cover up sin. We don't say, well, you know what? You know what, officer? I know you just pulled me over, but, you know, I mean, God is actually King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he really didn't mind that I was going 15 over. (laughs) That would be a misuse of freedom. Yeah, I mean, yeah, God is certainly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but you must honor this individual for God's namesake. And that's what Peter's talking about. Verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's a great statement. Notice the book ends here. Honor everyone, honor the emperor. Love the brotherhood and uh, fear God are right in between there. So his point is honor everyone. From the weak and the helpless, the marginalized in society, the people that you think, oh, you know, why would I honor this person? Look what they did to themselves. It's the way our society looks at things. That's the way, I mean, we see that in our own human hearts. We see somebody that has actually shipwrecked their life because of drugs or whatever else. They've just made bad decisions and then there they are. And well, you know, they kind of deserve the situation they're in and we don't honor them or the rich and powerful, the people that are over us. Well, you know, I don't have to honor them. In fact, we sometimes feel jealous for people that have power over us. I wish I had that kind of power or we don't like to be told what to do. And so we're tempted not to honor the weak or the powerful. Peter here is saying, honor everyone, everyone. It doesn't get any larger than that. I mean, that's, that's quite a set group, huh? Everyone love the brotherhood. This understanding is that in loving one another and the brotherhood here is focused on the brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And uh, comes from the Greek word adelphites, and, and basically it means women and men. So don't you know get stuck on brotherhood. It's brother and sisterhood, and it means the church. We're to love one another. Why? Because our love for one another, the unity that we will generate in Christ, the caring for one another. What does that show the world? That shows the love and power and grace of God, and that will draw people. To Christ and to his salvation. Fear God. Yeah, and that means fear God. Phobos means fear. That's real. That's where we get our word for phobia. Right? It means to fear God. People go, well, yeah, it just means to stand in awe. Oh, no. No, it means, it means to fear him. Okay? That's what that means. Um, Jesus clarified that we are not to fear other individuals, but we fear God. Not just stand in awe of him, fear him. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. And these are hard words from Jesus. Rather fear him who can destroy both body or both soul and body in hell. God has power. God is not mean, but he's dangerous. We don't cross God. And that's where Peter's going with this. Fear God. You don't fear people. You don't fear the emperor. You don't fear anybody. You don't fear for your life. You fear God. Why? Because God is God. (laughs) 
Now, in Paul's letters, and, and this is kind of introducing a new little part here, um, in Paul's letters, in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, and if you want the references, uh, you can ask me after the, the sermon, but I'm not going to read those passages. But in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, Paul lists um, relationships that were the building blocks of ancient households. And so he talks about servants or slaves and masters. He talks about children and fathers, parents. And then he talks about husband, husbands and wives and these relationships. Peter here is going to do the same thing, but he's only going to mention servants and masters. And this is a servant that probably worked within the household, looking at the Greek term and, and uh, marriage relationships. And we're not going to get into that until a few weeks. And we'll look at that together. But what's interesting about this is that these building blocks of families in, you know, of society and, and these type of relationships were found in households were the most intimate of all relationships. And it's in those most intimate settings that oftentimes the greatest abuses can take place, right? If you're an officer, the most dangerous call is probably a domestic, a domestic one. I mean, there is something about the emotion, the feeling, the passion, everything within tight, intimate relationships. They can be extreme. They can be beautiful beyond measure. They can shine forth the glory of God, but they can also be extremely dangerous if gone bad. They can be very abusive. That's where most abuse happens, right? And these types of relationships. And so Peter is going to focus on these types of relationships. He's going to look at um, servants and he's going to look at um, women and as Paul looked at children as well. But they were very vulnerable. They were put in a very difficult situation. A servant could have a really bad master. A wife could have an abusive husband. And so Peter's going to write to these individuals. He's going to refer to them and how they are to respond in these types of situations where these abuses can take place. So he writes in, in verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a precious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Servants are to be subject to their masters, not out of fear of their masters. And sometimes we look at these versions and that's not, it's not out of fear of the master here. It's out of fear of God. That's what he was just talking about here. What Peter is basically saying is he's saying, look, I know that this is difficult. But if you rebel, that does not show the love of God. Unless your master is asking you to do something, he doesn't get into this, you know, that is ungodly, that is outside of God, then, you know, then you need to reject that, right? Peter, in Acts 5, 29, we obey God over man. However, what Peter's talking about is that it's in these relationships when the love of God can be powerfully shown, when we honor those who are not very good to us. Jesus taught on this all day long. Sermon on the Mount, love those who persecute you. Love your enemies, good, do, you know, do good to those who persecute you, harm you. When we look at Jesus and what he went through, and we're going to look at that actually in verse 21 in just a moment. Peter's main focus for this entire passage is verse 12 that we already covered. I'm going to read it again. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. That means among non-believing people. When you see the word Gentile, it means people without God. Honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers 
And if a slave or servant became a believer, he would open up himself or she would open up herself to being harmed further, to suffer abuse because of their faith. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of, uh, the day of visitation. In other words, when we love those who harm us, and it's in these type of situations where most harm can come, when you're vulnerable. But when we love those who harm us, we have the opportunity to draw them to Christ so that they will be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit so that when God arrives to judge the living and the dead, they will worship the Lord with us because they will be redeemed with us. When you look at Acts and when you look at 2 Timothy and you see that Paul was excited to go through the court system as he appealed to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen, and he was caught in Jerusalem and brought all the way to Rome. He knew it could end in his own death. But he said, wow, what an opportunity it is to share the gospel in these courtrooms with the mighty and the powerful people of Rome. He was after their hearts. And Peter is telling these servants, be after your master's heart. Perhaps it is only you in this intimate context. And I know it's abusive. I know it's hard. But perhaps it's only you that God is going to reach through and rescue this individual and change them in Jesus Christ. Now, this strategy happened again and again and again. If you want to know how Christianity grew, with the weak and the helpless, loving the powerful, honoring them in Jesus Christ's name, drawing them to Christ. Ultimately, Constantine the Great was baptized. Within 300 years, the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as its official religion. It's quite remarkable, the growth of Christianity, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. Through the loving people of Christ. Verse 21, for to this you have been called, he's still talking to servants, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Are you ready for what he said? Do you, you realize what he's saying here? It just dawned on me when I was studying this passage this last week. I'd never seen it like this before. Jesus was God's ultimate sacrifice for you and me. When he died upon the cross, he took away our sin. He took away our sin. His sin, our sin died with him. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that becomes a reality. It's already done, but we need to acknowledge it by faith. What's interesting is that Jesus Christ stepped into a sacrificial system that was already up and rolling and had been worked for centuries. That was given to us in the Old Testament and the law of Moses. Nowhere in the sacrificial system would you take an animal and cruelly destroy it before sacrificing it. God is not cruel. He would never have asked that of the priests. In fact, the sacrifice of animals was very humane. It was kind of like a barbecue. They would kill the animal. They would drain the animal, but it was quick. And then they would roast it. What is going on with Jesus then? Have you ever asked yourself that? What is the deal with the passion? So much of the gospels are focused on Jesus being whipped, beaten, ridiculed, beard ripped out, crown of thorns on his head, mocked, whipped all the way to the cross. Like, why couldn't he is, have just been, you know, beheaded or thrown off a cliff? I'm sorry to be so graphic, but, you know, I mean, honestly, what is that all about? I mean, a sacrifice basically works when the sacrificed is killed. What's with the passion? Peter gives us some light here. What it's about. 
For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus Christ not only stepped into our water at baptism, which he didn't need, but he also stepped into our suffering. He stepped into our suffering. Jesus knew that you and I would suffer as we stood up for the name of Christ. As we shared the gospel, he knew that we would be ridiculed. And in some places in this world, perhaps killed, perhaps beaten, perhaps, you know. The more vulnerable we make ourselves, especially going on beyond the borders of our country, the more vulnerable we make ourselves, the more we will suffer like Christ. So Jesus Christ provided us an example, but more than that, or actually I should say more than that, but also he can now relate with us in our suffering. Look at Hebrews chapter two, verse 10 through 11. This is my last verse here. I mean it. It was right and proper that in bringing many sons to glory, I was reading this, by the way, I was reading this last night on the couch. And I was reading it in the ESV, and then I went to the J.B. Phillips translation. It's more paraphrastic in translation, but I just love the way J.B. Phillips translates this. But I just began to weep. It just came over me uncontrollably. It was just, and I, I went in, I read it to Zoe, and then I went in, I read it to Ava, and then I read it to Trisha. And if Aiden was home, I would have read it to him too. But it was just like, do you get what's being said here? It just blew me away. But listen to this. It was right and proper that in bringing many sons to glory, God from whom and by whom everything exists should make the leader of their salvation. That's Jesus, a perfect leader through the fact that he suffered. For the one who makes men holy and the men who are made holy share a common humanity. Do you, do you understand what's going on here? When we suffer we're sh for, for the sake of Christ, we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ and we're becoming like him. In his humanity, in his perfect humanity, we're being perfected in weakness. Doesn't Paul talk about that? Verse 18 For by virtue of his own suffering under temptation, he is able to help those who are exposed to temptation. That's Jesus. Jesus not only gave us an example, but is able to say to us when we undergo suffering for his name's sake, Jesus can look at us in the eyes and say, I know what you're going through. I knew that you would go through this and I'm here for you. I will empower you and strengthen you to go through this time of, of difficulty. And it is through this suffering that we can bring honor to the name of God. And it is through this suffering that we ourselves are actually purified by fire. And can more so even identify with our Lord and Savior. Now just think of how important this scripture was to the early Christians who were undergoing extraordinary suffering. Think of the Christians around the world right now. We just saw Pastor Ravi in that little video. Christians are undergoing extraordinary persecution in India right now. All around the world. Are we with them? Are we walking with them? Because Jesus is. Amen.